Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our today webinar on the automatic exchange of information. Uh, please let me know whether you can hear me well. Uh, could you please uh, uh, write something like yes or maybe just a plus in the chat box uh, that you can see on your screen? Great, thank you. Uh, I can see that. Thank you. Great, so that means we can begin. Um, so as have already been said, uh, the topic of today webinar is the automatic exchange of information, uh, theory and practice. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is Ina Gerasimova and I am El Tom, uh, Thomas lawyer. Uh, so the plan of today webinar is the following. First, we're going to talk about the um, about uh, what, what is the automatic exchange of information and uh, what is the purpose of the automatic exchange of information. We will cover briefly the background um, of the uh, current automatic exchange of information. Then we're going to talk about the theory and practice of the automatic exchange of information. Uh, then we will move on to talk about the current procedures related to the automatic exchange of information. And finally, we're going to talk about the implications of the automatic exchange of information and uh, possible um, problems of its uh, application in practice. So let's begin with uh, talking about the background of the automatic automatic exchange of information and uh, let's talk about the de definition and the purpose of uh, the automatic exchange of information. Uh, so for many years uh, countries around the world have been engaging in uh, the automatic exchange of information in order to tackle offshore tax evasion and other forms of uh, non-compliance. Uh, the OECD as you all know has been active in facilitating automatic exchange by creating the legal framework developing technical standards, providing guidance and training and seeking to improve automatic exchange at a practical level. As was shown by the uh, 2012 OECD report to the G20 in Los Cabos, automatic, automatic exchange of information is widely practiced and is a very effective tool to counter tax evasion and to increase voluntary tax compliance. Uh, in 2010, uh, the U.S. enacted the laws commonly known as FATCA, requiring withholding agents to withhold 30% of the gross amount of certain U.S. connected payments made uh, to foreign financial institutions unless such financial institutions agree to perform specified due diligence procedures to identify and report information about U.S. persons that hold accounts with them uh, to the U.S. tax authorities. Uh, many jurisdictions have opted uh, to implement FATCA on an intergovernmental basis and more specifically to collect and exchange the information required to be reported under FATCA on the basis of a Model 1 FATCA intergovernmental agreement. Uh, many of these jurisdictions Sorry. Uh, many of these jurisdictions have also shown, shown interest in leveraging the investments made for implementing the FATCA IGA to establish automatic exchange um, relationships with other jurisdictions, uh, which themselves are introducing similar rules. So with the strong support of the G20, the OECD together with G20 countries and in close cooperation with the EU and other stakeholders has since developed the standard for, automatics, uh, for automatic exchange of financial account information or the so-called standard, which is basically, uh, which is based on the FATCA. Uh, this is also a, a standardized automatic exchange model which builds on the FATCA IGA to maximize efficiency and minimize um, the costs for government, the governments of different jurisdictions that joined uh, the common reporting standards. So uh, today we're going to, to discuss um, uh, the CRIS. Um, so what is uh, the automatic exchange of information? Uh, in broad terms, um, the financial institutions report information to the tax administration 
in the, in the jurisdiction in which they are located. Uh, the information consists of details of financial assets they hold on behalf of taxpayers from jurisdictions uh, with which the tax administration exchanges information. The tax administrations then exchange that information. So uh, let's see um, how it looks like on the slide. Uh, so here we've got uh, two possible jurisdictions, A and B. As you can see, the financial institutions in the jurisdiction A um, uh, collect information on uh, the account holders in its jurisdiction. And then using the IT plat platform, uh, they send this information to the jurisdiction A tax administration. And then the jurisdiction A tax administration exchanges this information with jurisdiction B tax administration. And then uh, the jurisdiction B tax administration collects information from its financial institutions about their account holders and then exchanges this information with jurisdiction A tax administration. Uh, so as was previously said, um, the purpose of automatic exchange is to counter tax evasion and to increase voluntary uh, tax compliance. Uh, the common reporting standards um, was, a, was finally approved by the OECD on the 15th of July 2014, and it calls on jurisdictions to obtain information from their financial institutions and automatically exchange that information with other jurisdictions on an annual basis. Uh, the common reporting standards uh, set, uh, sets out the financial account information to be exchanged, the financial institutions required to report the different types of accounts and taxpayers covered, as well as common due diligence procedures to be followed by financial institutions. So today we are going to talk briefly about all these um, uh, subjects. So the, uh, the, the, the financial institutions that need to report the information, uh, the reportable accounts, uh, the information that has to be collected, reported and exchanged. So we are going to cover all these in a few moments. Uh, so the common reporting standards itself consists of the following elements. Uh, the common reporting standards, uh, then secondly, the modal uh, competent authority agreement, C uh, the so-called CAA, uh, the commentaries, uh, the official commentaries to the common reporting standards, and finally, the guidance on technical solutions, uh, including an XML schema to be used for exchanging the information and standards in relation to data safeguards and confidentiality transmission and encryption. Um, right. So uh, the, the, uh, the most efficient and the easiest way for countries to start exchanging information is to actually join uh, the Model Competent Authority Agreement those countries who uh, who joined CRIS but haven't signed the Model Competent Authority Agreements, they will still exchange information, but based on the bilateral uh, agreements concluded between um, this jurisdiction and other jurisdictions. Uh, so, um, as of today, over 60 jurisdictions have already signed the CIS uh, multilateral competent authority agreement and uh, uh, for, with uh, 90, 44 jurisdictions uh, joining the common reporting standards. So now there are only a uh, few jurisdictions left that haven't joined uh, the common reporting standards like uh, the United States, uh, Belize, um, so very few jurisdictions, Taiwan, um, and also, uh, um, in addition to the international framework, uh, domestic implementation of the CRIS in, in the committed jurisdictions is now also progressively becoming a reality. And the first major milestone in this respect was the approval of the amended EU D Directive on Administrative Cooperation in December 2014. Uh, so, uh, in, order, um, in order for the automatic exchange uh, to work between different jurisdictions, uh, legal instruments have to be in place. 
So this can be uh, double tax agreements contain, containing the standard OECD model Article 26. This can also be the multilateral uh, convention on mutual administrative assistance in tax uh, matters, Article 6 of which specifically provides for the optional use of uh, automatic exchange. And finally, this can be the tax information um, exchange agreements uh, that provide for the automatic exchange of information. But as I, as I have already said, uh, the easiest way for the countries is to sign the multilateral um, uh, the model competent authority agreement and in this case um, the countries will automatically um, start exchanging uh, the information with other participants of the model competent authority agreement as soon as they uh, implement uh, this uh, this agreement uh, in their internal jur jurisdiction. Okay, so who is going to report the information, uh, to collect the information and report it? Uh, this will be the financial institutions in different jurisdictions uh, that uh, joined uh, the uh, common reporting standards. So what are these reporting financial institutions? In order to um, in order to establish uh, whether certain whether a certain financial institution will be a reporting financial institution, there's there's a certain algorithm uh, to define it. So um, step uh, step first is to decide whether this organization is an entity. If uh, if this institution is not an entity, uh, it's it's automatically a non-reporting financial institution. Uh, if the institution is an entity, then the step two is to decide uh, whether it is a, an entity in the participating jurisdiction. Um, if no, then automatically it's a non-reporting financial institution. If yes, uh, then we move on uh, to consider the step three. Is the entity a financial institution? If no, then it automatically means that the financial institution is non-reporting. If yes, then we move on to the step four. Uh, is the entity a, a non-reporting financial institution? Uh, if yes, uh, then it is a non-reporting financial institution. If the answer to that step four is no, uh, then we, we have uh, the reporting financial institution. So now let's consider... Uh, Let's consider it in a, uh, uh, let's see uh, what, uh, what entities will actually be considered as reporting financial institutions. So you can see the reporting financial institutions on the slide. Uh, these are the following uh, legal entities. First, uh, depository institutions. So generally, depository institutions include saving banks, commercial banks, saving, uh, savings and loan associations, and credit unions. Uh, secondly, uh, the custodial institutions will also be considered as the reporting financial institutions. Custodial institutions generally include uh, custodian, uh, custodian banks, brokers, and uh, central securities depositories. Uh, the investment entities uh, generally in include entities investing, reinvesting, or trading in financial instruments, uh, portfolio management or investing, administering or managing financial assets. Uh, if we talk about the uh, fourth group of reporting financial institutions, it it's the specified insurance companies, which uh, generally include most life insurance, insurance companies in different jurisdictions. And finally, we've got uh, the list of non-reporting financial institutions, which include uh, government entities and their pension funds, uh, international organizations, uh, cent central banks in different jurisdictions, certain retirement funds, qualified credit card issuers, exempt uh, collective investment vehicles, uh, trustee documented, uh, documented trust, and other low-risk financial institutions. So uh, now that we've decided uh, which uh, entities will be considered as the reporting financial institutions, uh, now we can move on uh, to consider uh, the financial accounts 
uh, which are reportable accounts. Uh, so once a reporting financial institution has identified the financial accounts they maintain, uh, they are required to review those accounts to identify, uh, to identify uh, whether any of them are reportable accounts as defined in the uh, So we've got uh, the four groups of accounts that need to be reviewed. Uh, first is the depository accounts. Um, depository accounts gen generally include uh, checking and savings accounts. Uh, of the accounts that need to be reviewed is the custodial accounts. Custodial accounts is uh, the accounts other than an insurance contract or injurator contract uh, for the benefit of another person that holds financial uh, assets. The third group of uh, financial accounts that, need, that will be reviewed by the financial institutions is equity and debt interests, which include debt and equity interests and their equivalents, such as interest in partnership and trust. And the fourth group uh, of financial accounts that will be reviewed is the cash value insurance contracts and annuity contracts, which include contracts such as insurance against mortality, morbidity, accident, liability, or property risk uh, that has a cash value, and, contra and contracts where uh, payments are made for a period of time determined in whole or in part by life expectancy. Um, certain financial accounts are seen to be low risk of being used to evade tax and are therefore specifically excluded from need needing to be reviewed. These are called excluded accounts. So these categories are shown on the slide. Um, so as you can see, um, non-reportable or excluded accounts are the retirement and pension accounts, uh, the non-retirement uh, tax-favored accounts, uh, term life insurance contracts, estate accounts, escrow accounts, depository accounts due to non-returned overpayments, and other low-risk excluded accounts. Uh, in order to accommodate jurisdiction-specific financial accounts, which also present a low risk of being used to evade tax, uh, the common reporting standards provide for participating jurisdictions to define in their domestic law other financial accounts as excluded accounts. Uh, this is subject, uh, obviously, to certain conditions, including that the categorization as such does not frustrate the purposes of the standard. It is expected that each jurisdiction uh, would have only one list of domestically defined excluded accounts as opposed to different lists uh, for the different participating jurisdictions and that it would make such a list publicly available. Um, then, we will, uh, then we will move on uh, to consider the financial accounts which are reportable accounts. Um, Sorry for the delay. So, as I, as, I, as I have already said, once a reporting financial institution has identified the financial accounts they maintain, they are required uh, to review these accounts to, and, uh, to identify whether any of them are reportable accounts. Uh, where they are found, uh, whether they find uh, if they establish that the financial account is a reportable account, then the information in relation to such account must be reported to the, uh, to the tax authority within the same jurisdiction. So, uh, a reportable account is defined as an account held by one or more reportable persons or by passive non-financial entity with one or more controlling persons that is a reportable person. Establishing this uh, requires two tests as set out on the slide. So the first test, the first test is in relation to the account holder, and the second test is in relation to the controlling persons of certain entity account holders. So first, uh, here we've got another algorithm uh, to determine whether the financial account is a reportable account. Uh, test one is to determine whether the account holder is a reportable person. If uh, the answer to this question is yes, then uh, the account is reported in relation to the account holder. 
If no, then uh, the account is non-reported in relation to the account holder. If uh, the account uh, is reported in relation to the account holder, then we move on to consider the test two. Is the account holder a passive non-financial entity with one or more controlling persons that is a reportable person? If the answer to this question is yes, then the account is reported in relation to the account holder and, and the uh, controlling persons. If no, uh, then it's not reported in relation to the account holder. So as you can see, um, all the reportable accounts uh, can be divided into two categories. So the reportable accounts by virtue of the account holder and the reportable accounts by virtue of the account holder's controlling persons. Uh, the first test establishes whether a financial account is a reportable account by virtue of the account holder. So this test uh, can also be broken down into two further steps as shown on the slide. So uh, first, we need to determine wh uh, whether the account holder is a reportable jurisdiction person, which means whether the account holder is a resident in the, ju in the jurisdiction which joined uh, the common reporting standards. If no, then it's automatically a non-reportable account. If yes, then we move on to consider the step two, whether the account holder is a reportable person. Uh, if uh, the answer to this question is yes, uh, then we've got the reportable account. If the answer to the second question is no, then we've got an unreportable account. So how we... Um, uh, let's consider the step of uh, the step number one in more detail. Uh, so how we define whether the account holder is a reportable jurisdiction person. A reportable jurisdiction person is an individual or, or an entity resident in a reportable jurisdiction for tax purposes under the laws of that jurisdiction. Or if, uh, if it cannot be defined, then uh, based on the uh, place of the effective management of uh, such an entity. Uh, a reportable jurisdiction is a jurisdiction with which an agreement is in place uh, pursuant to the automatic exchange of information under the common reporting standards. Um, and finally, each jurisdiction must uh, publish a list of these uh, reportable jurisdictions. So uh, therefore, in the first instance, in the first instance, a financial institution must check whether a financial account they maintain is held by a person who is resident in a jurisdiction on the published list. Um, yes, and um, one more thing, as for establishing the tax residency, according to the general rule for pre-existing accounts, uh, the financial institution must determine the residency of the account holder based on the information it has on its files. Whereas for new accounts, a self-certification is required from the account holder. Uh, now let's con uh, consider in more detail uh, the step number two, uh, whether the account holder is a reportable person. So the reportable jurisdiction person will then be a reportable person unless specifically excluded from being so. In general, the specific exclusions are the following. A corporation, uh, the stock of which is regular traded on one or more established securities markets, because they are scrutinized in any case, and a related ent entity of theirs, a government entity, an international organization, a central bank, or a financial institution which will itself be subject to the rules and obligations uh, contained in the common reporting standards. So the, these entities are considered as low risks as low risk entities because they are subject uh, to the uh, to the at least to the same level of scrutiny as the reportable persons under the common reporting standards okay so now let's uh, consider the second group of reportable accounts uh, re <coughs> sorry the reportable accounts by virtue of the controlling persons so again we have um, the, the two-step algorithm, uh, which you can see on the slide. 
it's, it is worth noting that regardless of whether the financial account is a reportable account by virtue of the account holder, so the first group of uh, reportable accounts, there is the second test in relation to the controlling persons of the certain entity account holders. This may mean that additional information is required to be reported in relation to an already reportable account or that previously non-reportable account becomes a reportable account by virtue of, of its controlling persons. The second test can also be broken down into two steps, as you can see on the slide, and the explanations of each step will be provided uh, on the next slides. So step number one is, is to determine whether the account holder is a passive non-financial entity. If no, uh, then uh, the, the account is not, not reportable in relation to the controlling persons. If uh, we have a passive non-financial entity, uh, then we need to consider the second step, whether this entity have one or more controlling persons which are reportable persons. If the answer to this question is no, uh, then the account is not reportable in, in relation to the controlling persons. If the answer to the step, um, step two question is yes, then we've got the reportable account. So now let's consider both steps uh, in more detail. So uh, the first step is uh, whether the account holder is a passive non-financial entity. Uh, so the general rule is that a passive non-financial entity is a non-financial entity that is not an active um, uh, non-financial entity. Uh, the definition of active non-financial entity essentially it excludes entities that primarily receive passive income, such as dividends, interest, uh, rents, etc., and it and includes entities that are publicly traded or related to a publicly traded entity, governmental entities, international international organizations central banks, or holding non-financial entities of non-financial groups. An exception to this is an investment entity uh, that is not a participating jurisdiction financial institution, which is always treated as a passive non-financial entity. So um, the, the general definition of an active non-financial institution uh, given in the common reporting standards is as follows. Uh, it's an entity uh, more than 50% um, of income uh, of which for the last reporting period is active uh, income or uh, more, more than 50% of assets of which, which produce income are also active. Uh, so there is no actually... Um, there is no specific definition of passive and active income in the common reporting standards. However, uh, the common reporting standards refer to the dom domestic legislation uh, of the jurisdictions where the financial um, institutions, the reporting financial institutions, are allocated. But uh, of course, uh, such uh, types of income as dividends, interest, rents, royalty, they will always be. Um, considered as passive income. Yes, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you that uh, a non-financial entity is obviously the entity that is not a financial institution, and all non-financial entities are split into passive non-financial entities and active non-financial entities. Uh, with additional procedures required in relation to passive non-financial entities, uh, reflecting the greater tax evasion risks uh, that they pose. Okay, uh, now let's move on to consider the step number two. Uh, so the question that we consider within the step number two is, uh, does the entity have one or more controlling persons which are reportable persons? If the entity account holder is a passive non-financial entity, uh, then the financial institution must look through the entity to identify its controlling persons. And if the controlling persons themselves are reportable persons, 
uh, which means they are the tax residents in the jurisdiction that also joined the common reporting standards. Then the information in, re in relation to the financial account must be reported, including details of the account holder and each reportable controlling person. Okay, so uh, what do we actually understand by controlling persons? Um, the, term, the term controlling persons correspond to the term beneficial owner as described in the Financial Action Task Force part recommendations. For an entity that is a legal person, uh, the term controlling persons means the natural person who exercises control over the entity. Uh, generally, natural persons with a controlling ownership interest in the entity. Uh, determining a controlling ownership interest uh, will depend uh, on the ownership structure of the entity and control over the entity may be exercised either by direct ownership or shareholding or through indirect ownership or shareholding of one or more intermediate entities. For example, controlling persons include any natural person that holds directly or indirectly more than 25% of the shares or voting rights of an entity as a beneficial owner. If no such person exists, then any natural person that otherwise exercises control over the management of the entity, for example, the senior managing official of the company, can be considered as the controlling person. For example, an individual A may own 20% interest in entity B, and although held in the name of individual C, pursuant to a contractual agreement, Individual A also controls 10% of the voting shares in entity B. In such instance, individual A should meet the definition of controlling person. Um, part recommendations do not require the determination of beneficial ownership of an entity, which is or is a majority owned subsidiary of a company that is listed on a stock exchange and is subject to market regulation and to disclosure requirements to ensure adequate transparency of beneficial ownership. So as I have already said, uh, the uh, publicly listed companies that are already scrutinized and um, they have to disclose the information on their beneficiaries. In any case, they are not subject to uh, disclosure within the common reporting standards. In the case of a partnership and similar arrangements, controlling persons means any natural person who exercises control through, through direct or indirect ownership of the capital or profits of the partnership, voting rights in the partnership, or who otherwise exercise control over the management of the partnership or similar arrangement. If we are talking about uh, a trust, in the case of a trust and entities equivalent to trust, the term uh, controlling persons is explicitly defined in the standard to mean uh, the set law, the trustee, uh, the protector, if any, uh, the beneficiary or classes of beneficiaries, and any other natural persons exercising ultimate effective control over the trust. If the set law trustee, uh, sorry, if the set law, trustee, protector, or beneficiary is an entity, uh, the reporting financial institution must identify the controlling persons of such entity in accordance with FAF part recommendations uh, that were discussed above. Uh, finally, there is one important general exception from reportable accounts. So unless any specific bank in any specific jurisdiction rules otherwise, the information on any existing entity account with a total balance not exceeding 250,000 US dollars as of the 31st of December of the year preceding the reportable year will not be disclosed unless the total balance of this account exceeds 250,000 US dollars as of the last date of any of the following reporting periods. So, as we know, under the common reporting standards, all jurisdictions have to report and exchange information on the accounts opened, the reportable accounts opened within their, within their jurisdictions within seven months 
from the end of the reportable period. So for those countries who joined uh, the common reporting standards in 2017, uh, they need uh, to exchange the information until, uh, until the, the end of September 2017. Those countries who join the common reporting standards in 2018, they need, uh, to, exchange, um, they need to exchange information uh, on the reportable accounts um, that existed in these jurisdictions in 2017 until uh, the end of September 2018. So let's say uh, we have an existing entity account in, uh, in let's say, Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus uh, joined uh, the common reporting standards and starts the automatic exchange of information in 2017. Uh, so Cyprus uh, has to report uh, the, the accounts and has to exchange information with other jurisdictions that start uh, automatic exchange of information in 2017. Uh, until the end of September 2017, um, about the accounts opened uh, in uh, 2016. And uh, the general exception is that the existing entity accounts uh, with a total balance uh, not exceeding 250,000 US dollars as of the 31st of December of the reportable period, so of the preceding year, they will not be disclosed and the um, Cy Cyper uh, Cyprus banks will not report and exchange information on such accounts. So th that, uh, that is really important. Unfortunately, there is no similar exception for the existing individual accounts, but there is such, an, uh, such a threshold for existing entity accounts. That's important to keep in mind. Uh, so now let's move on to consider the information that actually gets reported and exchanged. Once uh, the accounts are determined to be reportable accounts, then the financial institution must report information in relation to that account to the tax authority. Uh, this is the information that a jurisdiction agrees to exchange with its automatic exchange partners as specified in the competent authority agreement. So all the um, all the information that gets reported uh, can be divided into three groups. First, uh, the uh, identification information, so the information required for the automatic exchange partner jurisdiction to identify the account holder concerned. Uh, if it's the entity account, then we're talking about the entity. If it's an individual account, then we're talking about an individual. Second group of information is the account information. So uh, that, that's the information necessary to identify the account and the financial institution where the account is held. And the third group of information is the financial information. So the information that concerns uh, the activity taking place in the reportable account and the account balance. So together, uh, this information should be sufficient to identify the account holder and then to establish a picture of the compliance risk of that account holder. So whether they have properly declared the relevant financial information. Uh, so uh, let's consider the identification information that will be report reported first. So um, the information required to be reported in relation to individual and entity account holders that are reportable persons, as well as entities with controlling persons that are reportable persons and the controlling persons that, uh, themselves is as follows. Uh, the name of um, the account holder. So if it's an individual, then uh, the name of the individual, if it's uh, a company or an entity than the name of the company or an entity. Uh, the address, again, um, for the pre-existing accounts, the bank will get the address from, uh, from the files that it already has. As for newly opened accounts, the bank will take the address 
from the self-certification bank forms um, uh, that the company will submit um, for the purpose of bank account opening. Uh, the jurisdiction of residents or uh, jurisdictions of residents, and finally, the tax identification number. Additional information required to be reported in relation to individuals or controlling persons only is the date of birth and the place of birth. And this is one of the um, difference of the common reporting standards in comparison with FATCA, for example, because under FATCA, the date of birth of controlling persons is not disclosed, whereas under the common reporting standards, the date of birth of controlling persons is to be reported. Um, now let's consider the second group of information that is to be disclosed and um, reported, the financial information. So information required with respect to all reportable accounts is as follows. Uh, the account number or functional equivalent, the, the, the name and identifying number, if any, of the reporting financial institution. And finally, the account balance or value, including in the case of a cash value insurance contracts or in unity contracts, the cash value or surrender value or if the account was closed during the reporting period, only the closure of the account. Information uh, that is required with respect to depository accounts only is the total gross amount of interest paid or credited uh, to the account. Information that is required with respect to custodial accounts only is as follows. Uh, firstly, uh, the, total uh, the, total, the total gross amount of interest paid or credited to the account. Secondly, uh, the total gross amount of dividends paid or credited to the account. Thirdly, the total gross amount of other income generated with respect to the assets held in the account paid or credited to the account. And finally, the total gross proceeds from the sale or redemption of, fi of financial accounts paid or credited to the account. And there is the, uh, the last group of information uh, that, that is to be disclosed within the block of financial information required with respect to other accounts only, so not depository or custodial accounts. Uh, is the total gross amount paid or credited to the account holder with respect to the account uh, with respect to which the reporting financial institution is the obliga or debtor? Uh, it is important to note uh, the reporting period. So the information to be reported must be that as of the end of the relevant calendar year or other appropriate uh, reporting period. Uh, so as I have already said, according to the general rules, uh, according to the general rule, sorry, uh, for the countries that joined um, the automatic exchange of information in 2017, the first reporting period will be um, 2016. So they will need to report uh, the balance as of the end of 2016. For those countries who joined the automatic exchange of information in 2018, the first reporting period will be 2017. And the balance of the reportable accounts has to be reported as of the end of the 2017. However, some jurisdiction uh, can change this general rule so they can provide in their domestic legislation a different reporting period. So uh, the common reporting standards provide that in certain jurisdictions, um, the appropriate reporting period can be, for example, a month. In this case, the, financial the reporting financial institution will have to report uh, the balance, uh, the average monthly balance of such uh, of such reportable account so there can be exceptions to the general uh, general rule as you can see um, as for the currency the information must be reported in the currency in which the account is denominated and the currency must be identified in the information reported any currency conversions such as in relation to thresholds 
must be calculated by applying a spot rate as of the last date of the reporting period. And finally, it's worth uh, noting uh, the specific provisions with, um, with regards to the joint accounts. Each holder of a jointly held account is attributed the entire balance or value of the joint account, as well as the entire amounts paid or credited to the joint account. The same is applicable with respect to an account held by a passive non-financial entity with more than one controlling person with uh, sorry with more than uh, with more than one controlling person that is a reportable person. Um, in the end, I would like to briefly consider um, the differences between FATCA model and Common Reporting Standards model uh, because many countries will actually apply both. So it's, um, it's important to appreciate um, the differences. So firstly, uh, FATCA and common reporting standards have different uh, reporting timeframes. Uh, secondly, the model uh, competent authority agreement is reciprocal, but can be adapted to be non-reciprocal, whereas uh, the model IGAs for FATCA can be either. Uh, FATCA is focused only and mainly on US citizens, and the common reporting standards is based on the tax residence of the purpose. So uh, the common reporting standards may give rise to practical issues such as uh, definitional differences in tax residence or dual residence, etc. Uh, as I have already said, the common reporting standards, unlike FATCA, requires the date of birth of the person to be provided in most cases whereas uh, this is not generally necessary under FATCA, uh, save where a tax identification number is not available. Also, the common reporting standards at FATCA have different exemptions for financial entities, which are deemed compliant under uh, FATCA IGAs. Uh, for example, local um, financial institute category, uh, jointly qualified retirement funds, investment trust, etc. Which are not exempt under the common reporting standards. The common reporting standards will impact a larger number of accounts. Um, another uh, another um, difference of the common reporting standards is that they contain no de minimis exemption for pre existing individual accounts, although it does differentiate between low value, less than 1 million uh, US dollars accounts, and high value accounts by providing for different documentary requirements. Um, there is a 250,000 US dollars threshold for pre existing entity accounts that I've already talked about today. And new individual accounts require self certification and have no de minimis thresholds, as I have already mentioned today. FATC imposes a possible withholding tax. Uh, the common reporting standards does not. Uh, non compliance will be dealt with under domestic law. Uh, the con reporting standards relies heavily on self-certification. Also, there are special uh, rules under the common reporting standards for non-participating jurisdictions. And finally, the common reporting standards has different rules for the insurance industry to FATCA. So there is no exemption from re review for an existing book of business and no de minimis threshold. Under FATCA, the existing book of business may be exempt or otherwise benefit from a 250,000 US dollars threshold. Now let's move on uh, to consider the implementation and the practical application of automatic exchange of information. And I thought that the best way of uh, considering uh, the practical application of automatic exchange is to consider two examples. Uh, so the first example uh, will be as follows. We've got, let's assume that we've got a BVA company uh, with a bank account in Cyprus. Uh, both jurisdictions have signed uh, the multi multilateral competence authority agreement and start information exchange in 2017. In this scenario, uh, the Cyprus bank sends uh, the reportable information on the entity account, uh, so the account holder, to Cyprus tax authorities. Then the Cyprus tax authorities uh, send this information to the BVI tax authority. 
if the BVI company is not a passive non-financial uh, entity uh, with the controlling persons residents of the jurisdictions participating in the multilateral uh, competent authority agreements, then the automatic exchange of information is over. So as soon as the Cyprus tax authorities send the information uh, on the account holder uh, to the BVI tax authority, the, other, the automatic exchange information is closed in this scenario. Now let's consider uh, the second example. So we've got the same facts. The BVI company uh, with, a, with an open bank account uh, in Cyprus. However, in this scenario, bank classifies uh, the entity with the open bank account in Cyprus as the passive non-financial entity and establishes that the controlling person uh, or beneficiary of this passive non-financial entity is an individual. Uh, the resident of the jurisdiction participating in the multilateral competent authority agreement, for example, Russia. In this scenario, uh, the Cyprus bank will send um, to the Cyprus tax authority the information not only with respect to the company, to the BVI company, uh, the account holder, but also uh, the information about the beneficiary of the BVI company or the controlling person. Uh, in this case, the Cyprus Tax Authority sends the information about the company account to the BVI and simultaneously sends the information about the, the BVI company account and also about the company's uh, beneficiary or controlling person to Russia because the controlling person is tax resident in Russia, well, according to the facts of this particular scenario. Um, I must say that there are actually some practical uh, problems uh, related to the automatic exchange of information. So firstly, as I have already said, uh, not all jurisdictions and countries have joined um, the common reporting standards. And even those um, countries who have joined uh, the automatic exchange of information under common reporting standards, they, they are still um, they are still implementing uh, the common reporting standards in uh, their domestic uh, um, legislation and they uh, they adjust their domestic le legislation in accordance with the common reporting standards. Uh, I, I have already mentioned the EU uh, directive. Um, that is one of the examples of the implementation of uh, the common reporting standards in national legislation. Um, also, uh, the, ne the necessary uh, IT infrastructure must be in place uh, in order for the countries to implement their con reporting standards. Um, furthermore, as I have already said, um, the financial um, reporting institution will exchange information only prescribed uh, under the common reporting standards, so it will be limited information. Not all information will be exchanged. As I have already said, that there is an exception with regards to the uh, pre-existing entity accounts uh, with the um, with a balance account not exceeding two thousand fifty hundred thousand US dollars. Um, and despite all this, uh, the automatic exchange of information is a uh, good alternative uh, to the uh, inf exchange of information upon request and uh, it can efficiently help countries uh, tackle tax evasion and tax frauds. Uh, so um, we actually expect uh, those countries who haven't joined the OTAC exchange of information actually join the automatic exchange of information in the nearest future and uh, if if they uh, don't do it willingly then they will probably be forced to do it uh, so that's uh, the end of uh, um, our today uh, webinar on the automatic exchange of information um, atomic corporate service um, offers uh, a broad range of uh, services in different jurisdictions, including registration and maintenance of the companies in more than 35 jurisdictions, creation and restructuring of the international holding, holding structures, immigration services, accounting audits, and preparation of the financial reporting, 
international tax planning, opening bank accounts, legal services, and other services. Also, we have uh, an interesting project that we can uh, offer uh, that we can offer to our partners and clients now. Uh, for those who are interested in investments in Cyprus property, uh, you can learn more about this pro project by going to uh, www.eltomaproperty.com, or you can just uh, look at the uh, amazing views of Cyprus property uh, on our website. Uh, you can see the contact information on the last uh, slide. Uh, thank you for your attention uh, and we hope to um, hear from you and see you in our next webinars. Thank you for your attention and have a good day. Thank you. Bye.